Today is a paramedic review. We're now trying to prepare you to take the National Registry, which we know consists of multiple different sections. Um, so let's jump into what those sections are. First one, respiratory, that we're gonna be talking about today. Next, cardiology. We got medical, trauma, OB, pediatrics, and operations. So obviously it's a lot of different sections. Uh, paramedic school is typically uh, broken up into these different sections. And I obviously I can't go over every single thing that's in there, but I selected uh, certain parts of each section to talk about and more of like a, a, a good review. An interesting question, when do we ventilate? Now, why do I say this is an interesting question? Because EMTs always had a very challenging time to say like, hey man, I'm gonna just give this patient oxygen via we'll say a nasal cannula, now we're breathing mask. But when do we actually say, hey, I have to give this patient breaths. Now, obviously we know that this patient's going to require oxygen. If we're gonna be usually ventilating for somebody, we want to give them oxygen. But understand, using a BVM, a bag valve mask, does not require you to hook it up to oxygen. If you want to uh, use like the best capabilities of that BVM, obviously hooking it up to oxygen greater than 15 liters per minute is gonna provide up to 100% oxygen concentration and it is the best way of delivering oxygen to a patient. Now, there is somewhat of a hierarchy when we talk about oxygen administration, least invasive to most invasive. Obviously, ventilating somebody is very invasive. We don't ventilate people just because they have a respiratory rate that's irregular, or they have a respiratory, what I mean by irregular is um, not in the normal range. We say an adult is 12 to 20, just because somebody is uh, we'll say at a respiratory rate of 26 or 10 doesn't mean that I'm going to ventilate for that patient. What's going to dictate my need to ventilate for that patient is if their respirations are not good enough for their life. All right. And there's certain things that we're going to look for uh, with this patient that's going to give us kind of a clue as to do we need to bag that patient or not? Now, one thing is how does my patient present? Again, just because my patient has a respiratory rate of let's say 10, that might be normal for them. But if my patient has a respiratory rate of 10 and it's shallow breathing and my patient appears to be mottled skin, cyanotic, things of that sort, that's when me as a provider have to say, hey man, this person's respiratory rate of 10, or it could be even 16, which we all know 16 is normal. If my patient's cyanotic with a respiratory rate of 16, that breathing rate is not adequate for that patient. And you need to be able to see that and say, hey man, we should probably be ventilating for this patient. Let's talk about this next question that's up here on the screen. Is it a life threat? Right? Is it a life threat? And what do you guys think? Is breathing considered a life threat? If the patient is not breathing, can they live? And the answer is no, of course not, right? Um, so do, do we need to assess that this patient's breathing early and jump in and fix that early? Absolutely. Okay, so whenever we start talking about like um, a hierarchy of needs or a hierarchy of needs, if you ever know Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that's exactly what we need to be thinking about. Physiologic needs is like, number one, we have to be able to breathe. We have to have a pulse, right? So that is a life threat. Now, what if the patient's bleeding? I know a lot of people, they, they like doing paramedic reviews because they, they have a difficult time with testing. Now, let's say that you're taking an exam and the exam states that you're responding to a 26-year-old uh, who was involved in a motor vehicle accident, upon arrival patients found unresponsive, shallow breathing, patient's pale, and the patient is bleeding. 
Is there anything that you as a paramedic need to know about that bleed before you can answer that question? Right? That's something you need to think about. What kind of bleed does this patient have? And is it worse than my patient's lack of breathing? Right? We said this patient's pale in color, maybe cyanotic, has shallow respirations, but the patient's also bleeding. Now, bleeding control is pretty quick. And everyone knows that, hey, man, I can go ahead and just hold direct pressure and try to stop that bleed. Um, so a lot of students, a lot of people taking a test are going to opt and say, yeah, man, I'm going to stop the bleed immediately. Now, what if I told you that bleed was not severe? What if I told you that bleed was venous bleeding and it was just some mild to moderate bleeding coming from the patient's forehead, but the patient's barely breathing? Which one takes precedence? Now, providers, you have to be able to say, hey, man, that bleeding is not life-threatening and that breathing is life-threatening. We need to be able to fix breathing before bleeding when needed. Now, if, if I said, or if you're taking the test and the test states that this patient has what appears to be an arterial bleed with severe bleeding, that's spurting, bright red blood, it gives you the whole thing. Yes, that needs to be controlled first. So you need to be able, to, when you take a test, to say, hey man, this takes priority. How about the next question that it shows there? What if the patient has pinpoint pupils? What if the patient has pinpoint pupils? We all know here, if you're watching this right now, you know that my patient has pinpoint pupils, probably an opioid overdose. We need to give Narcan, right? Now, let's say that that same patient has a respiratory rate of 18, pale, cyanotic, shallow respirations, would you give Narcan before ventilating a patient? Or would you ventilate the patient and then prepare Narcan? This is the type of testing process in your brain that needs to be understood. So when you see that question, you're going to say, hey, man, which one should I be doing first? Because in most of these type of tests, when you're taking the National Registry and things of that sort, you need to really think about in your head, hey, man, what am I going to do first, right? What happens now? So if my patient has pinpoint pupils and shallow respirations, I am 100% going to be bagging that patient while I prepare to give Narcan, okay? We need to fix the life threat. Ventilatory status or effort will clue you in, 100%. You need to look for that in testing, all right? A lot of these tests are not going to give you everything you want. I'm going to tell you right now, for me, if I'm taking a test question, if I'm taking a test and it's a respiratory question, I want to know what's my entitled capnography. I want to know what's my SpO2. I want to know what the respiratory rate, rhythm, and quality is. I want to know what my lung sounds are. But is, are they going to provide me with all that every single time? Absolutely not. All right. Your patient's a six, an 86-year-old female who suffers from seizures. She's found postictal with shallow respirations. Her breathing rate is eight breaths per minute and the patient appears to be pale. What is your treatment? Now, everything is cluing me into this patient has some sort of respiratory distress. We have a, a bad uh, breathing rate, which is eight. We know again, 12 to 20 is normal. Uh, it's stated shallow respirations. That was the big clue there. And the patient is pale. Everything is cluing me into ventilating this patient 100%. Did the question say that the patient had gurgling respirations? Now that is a adjective that needs to jump out at you as a test taker to say, hey man, gurgling respirations means that the patient has something occluding the airway, all right? A fluid, it could be the patient's vomit, could be um, saliva, it could be the patient's food, whatever the hell the patient had, but Whenever they use the term gurgle in a test question, we have to, have to, have to think about suctioning a patient. Now, real quick on suctioning. If I am to pick 
a yank hour tip, which you see here on the uh, PowerPoint. If I am deciding to, to utilize the yank hour tip, it's because I'm able to see what I'm suctioning. Okay, I can open up the patient's mouth. I can look in there. Remember, you don't want to pass the yank hour tip as far as you can. You want to be able to see whatever you're able to suction out. Um, for adults, we don't suction anything more than 15 seconds. Pediatrics, 10 seconds. Infants, five seconds. And we always suction on the way out. Okay, just a little quick, quick review there. Is my patient choking? How do we know if somebody's choking? All right, can they speak? If my patient can speak, cough, cry, whatever, whatever in sounds that are coming out of their mouth, but they feel like they're choking, it could be one of two things, basically. The least serious in this uh, instance would be that the patient irritated their esophagus and they feel like something's there, but it's not. Um, we see that a lot, or it can mean that the patient has a partial obstruction. How do I treat patients with a partial obstruction? Encourage them to cough, okay? Encourage them to cough. All, we're not going to get behind them and start hitting them on the back or putting them in a wrestling move, anything crazy like that. Um, you, all you want to do is just encourage them to cough until either that object comes out or my patient stops making a coughing sound. If they're not making a coughing sound, but they're trying to, and no air now is being exchanged from their trachea, now that patient's choking. Quick review on choking. First thing that I wanna know is my patient's conscious and alert, all right? If they are conscious, I need to go ahead and ask and get consent, right, to help. Like, hey man, are you, are you choking right now? If they say, yes, I'm choking, well, obviously they're not if they say that, but if they're able to move their head, tell, showing me that they're choking, I need to say, can I help you? If they allow me to help, now I can go ahead and perform the Heimlich maneuver or abdominal thrusts, right? Um, just remember, whenever you're performing the Heimlich maneuver on anybody, you always want to put one of your legs in between their legs, just so you are stable enough so where you don't tip over or fall down, right? Um, once this person does pass out, because remember two things are gonna happen once you're performing the Heimlich Maneuver, either they're gonna cough it out or they're gonna pass out. So if they pass out and you're holding on to them, there's a good chance that you're going over. So hold on to that person and uh, prepare for that. Is my patient unresponsive? Let's say my patient passes out. What changes? from me doing the Heimlich maneuver and my patient passes out is once they pass out, I'm going to gently place that person on a hard flat surface. First thing I wanna do is I wanna open their mouth. I look inside their mouth, is there anything that I can see? If there is, I can go ahead and take it out. Can I do blind finger sweeps? No, but if I see something, I'm gonna grab it. If I don't see anything, I'm now gonna perform CPR. 30 to two, before I give my two breaths, I'm gonna go ahead and look, do I see something? If I do, I can try to take it out. Now, as a paramedic, don't forget, you guys have the, cho the, the choice of using McGill forceps. We always travel as a team. One person should be doing chest compressions. The other person should be grabbing the airway bag and pulling out the McGill forceps and performing direct laryngoscopy. And we're gonna try to remove that item um, during chest compressions. If the person doing chest compressions is getting close to that 30, uh, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, back out. What we're looking for is anything in the mouth. If I don't see anything, I'm going to attempt two breaths. If my breaths go in, what's that telling me? That's telling me as a provider that whatever was blocking that airway before is no longer there, which is a good thing. That's what we wanted. Right, so if my breaths are going in, then I need to assess to see if my patient is breathing on their own, okay? Remember, if somebody has a pulse, but they're not breathing, we can perform rescue breaths. So uh, it's, a, it's a mouthful talking about FBAO or foreign body airway obstruction, but you gotta know the steps on uh, when to do chest compressions versus breathing for the patient. Just remember the whole goal here is to get whatever's in there, 
out. Now, if it's a kid, the only thing that changes is how we position ourselves. Okay. I'm not going to lift up little Jimmy up in the air while I'm doing the Heimlich maneuver. I'm going to get lower to get behind him or her. Right. I'm going to get down on one knee just to level myself behind the patient to perform my abdominal thrusts. And everything is the exact same with the child. Another thing that obviously changes once if you are two or more rescuers, it's 15 to two on those chest compressions when they go unresponsive. Are they an infant? Remember, infant is any child that is less than one. One, years of old, one year of age, if they're greater than one uh, and they are then, if they're greater than one, then they're considered a child. If they're less than one, they're an infant. You, and a lot of times you might not even know and you're not gonna be like, excuse me, does anyone know, right? If you assume that this is an infant, treat it as an infant, right? Now what changes, we do not do the Heimlich maneuver or abdominal thrust on infants. What we do is back slaps or back blows. What you see there on the top, that photo is back blows. We perform five back blows first. One, two, three, four, five. Support the head, rotate onto the other arm. And now you're gonna perform chest thrusts, five. We're gonna keep doing this, flipping from back blows to chest thrusts, to back blows to chest thrusts, five each until one of two things happens. Either that baby goes unresponsive or that little baby coughs it out. If they cough it out, awesome. We're gonna monitor them for their airway. Are they breathing on their own now? If they pass out, same concept as the adult or child slowly place or gently place that baby onto a hard flat surface. And now we're gonna perform CPR. Here's a, a very random thing in respiratory that you probably read about in P2 or whatever semester you did respiratory in, the Herring Brewer reflex. Now what this reflex is, it controls tidal volume, kind of. Right. So when, whenever we consider or talk about tidal volume, we're talking about the amount of air that fills up in your lungs. Now, when you take a really deep breath, believe it or not, you have some, a reflex and actually receptors, stretching receptors in your lungs. When your lungs start to expand and fill up with air, how do you know that your lungs are full? This is the reflex that basically tells your brain, hey, listen. It's called a neural reflex signal. And this reflex signal tells your brain, hey, our lungs are full. So what does that trigger you to do? Stop breathing, exhale, right? This reflex is what does that. All right, everyone's favorite uh, topic, pH balance. Now, you have to understand respiratory acidosis versus alkalosis when talking about taking a paramedic exam. Now, understand that this is just talking about respiratory related, right? I'm not talking about me uh, metabolic acidosis. Um, we could discuss that later, but right now, respiratory acidosis versus alkalosis, you need to know what causes it. So let's take a look. If my patient is breathing slowly, or shallow, or not breathing at all, if my patient's apneic, understand that you will start to increase in CO2, all right? So if you put on entitled capnography on your patient and you're trying to monitor, hey man, how, how much CO2 is this person blowing off? Well, obviously, if they're not blowing off anything, meaning they're not breathing or they're breathing really slowly, that CO2 starts to stack in their body. Now, if you remember, you and me, our respiratory rate is dependent on how much CO2 is in your body. Remember, CO2 or carbon dioxide is garbage. It's waste. And my body wants to get rid of it. Now, how do I get rid of CO2? I have to exhale it out. So again, if I do not exhale it out, it's just going to stack and build up in my body. You have to remember that. We call it CO2 retention. We retain CO2. Now, if you look on this chart, we have a pH balance chart and it's showing acidic being low pH. 
to alkaline, which is high pH. Now, neutral is what we are, right? 7.35 to 7.45 for the average human. Anything that goes lower is considered acidic. Now, with respiratory acidosis, respiratory acidosis, we're talking about our, remember, we build up CO2, and that will decrease our pH level. And that is dealt with slow respirations or shallow respirations, right? Causes acidosis. Now let's take a look at the next. So our patient's breathing fast now, breathing really fast. You think of somebody who's like um, having an anxiety attack, for example, hyperventilating. What's happening is they're getting rid of their CO2 so fast that their body can't keep up with the amount of CO2 that's getting rid of. Remember you have a, um, everything's always a balance in your body, right? Your normal CO2 has to be between 35 millimeters of mercury and 45. And if it's not, there are consequences. So when I breathe really fast and I get rid of all that CO2, my pH will now increase, okay? My pH starts to increase as I breathe fast. And this is called respiratory alkalosis. So how is this going to affect like a test that you're taking? They're going to give you some vital signs and you have to be, de be the one to deter or determine is this respiratory related or is it not? Okay. So if I give you an example of a patient that has a regular respiratory drive, all right, regular respiratory rate, rhythm and quality, nothing seems wrong with this person's respiratory rate, but the patient is acidotic for whatever reason. It's metabolic acidosis, right? It could be because the patient has sepsis or the patient's bleeding out and they're hypovolemic. Um, but you have to be able to say, hey man, that looks more like it's probably metabolic acidosis just because the patient isn't A, either holding their breath and becoming acidotic or breathing it out too fast, causing alkalosis, okay? Hope that helps. All right, let's talk about asthma, okay? Now, asthma, which is it's very common. People see it, talk about it all the time. Asthma causes an increase in mucus production and will also cause bronchoconstriction. So we got um, airway edema, which is causing bronchoconstriction. And also we have something called bronchospasming, which, which is occurring where those bronchioles are actually tightening on their own. So technically there's three things that are occurring with an asthma attack. Again, bronchospasms, increased mucus production and airway edema, okay? Now, let's talk about the problems of being an asthmatic. Obviously, they're going to have wheezing, right? Because that lower airway is being obstructed by one of those three things or all three of those things in one time. But understand this patient, they can force this air in, but they have a hard time getting the air out. Now, what's the problem with trapping air in your alveoli? Is it gets really difficult to exchange new good air with that old air that's stuck in those alveoli, right? And when that air gets trapped in that alveoli, now we're having a difficult time getting new air to diffuse. Now, you see another term here called status asthmaticus. Sounds crazy. Um, but all it is, is it's a severe asthma attack. A severe asthma attack that does not get fixed with conventional treatment. Now, your question might be, well, Mike, what, what the hell's conventional treatment? And you're seeing it here on the uh, PowerPoint right? This girl has got a meter dose inhaler that she's been prescribed, albuterol treatment, whatever her doctor prescribed. And typically that works for her asthma attack. Now, remember asthma attacks are, they occur from a trigger, right? Now everyone has different triggers. It could be um, pollen. It could be 
smoke coming out of an exhaust pipe. It could be whatever for that person. But if something is so bad that it triggers a extreme asthma attack, that meter dose inhaler isn't going to help, right? This person's going to be sucking down their meter dose inhaler and they start to freak out and then they call 911. So we show up. Is there other treatments that we can give this patient? Absolutely. Right. We have beta two agonists that we give. Right. So beta two agonists that we give in pre-hospital setting would be albuterol, albuterol and atrovent. Both have beta two properties. Remember, that's going to cause bronchodilation. So we're trying to allow more air to get in and out of those bronchioles because it's so constricted. Also, another really good one that people kind of discredit is epinephrine. Remember, epinephrine is a beta-2 agonist that also causes vasoconstriction. We know that it has some other effects, right? Maybe inotropic, chronotropic effects. Absolutely. Um, Lucas, do you have a question? Is that, what, is that what's called the... Um, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, racemic epinephrine. Oh, okay, so racemic epi is epinephrine that gets nebulized. That's all it means. Now, oh, okay. racemic epi is typically seen in patients who have croup. So little babies or little kids that have croup. Um, can it be used for asthmatics? Yeah, of course. You know, it's epinephrine. Um, but understand, racemic epi is given over a pretty long period of time you know, we're looking at several minutes versus immediate access of epi that we can give intramuscular. Now you would also think, hey man, if I'm giving medication intramuscular, isn't that going to take some time to work? Uh, believe it or not, epi works super fast. Okay. So epi works that whenever we give it intramuscular, remember preferred route is uh, lateral phi. If we give our epi, that's 0.03 of one in 1,000 we give in the lateral thigh. Now, what you mentioned is racemic epinephrine. That is one in 1,000 as well, but it's given in a nebulizer and it's 0.5. So it's 0.2 more than a normal dose, right? And we, and we allow that patient to breathe it in. But good question. So we, we mentioned two drugs so far. I mentioned, actually, I mentioned three. I mentioned albuterol. 2.5 milligrams that we're put in a nebulizer. Remember, nebulizer treatments, they get nebulized at least six liters per minute. At least six liters per minute, okay? So we drop that 2.5 milligrams in there and that's gonna cause that bronchodilation. Remember, it's also going to be causing uh, an increase in heart rate, but that's okay. This patient needs the bronchodilation. Next, we're gonna give that patient atrovent, now, atrovent is not, does not only have properties of beta-2 agonists, but also is a mucolytic. Now, we said, what are the three different things that are causing narrowing of the airway? We said bronchospasm, increased mucus production, and airway edema. So to get rid of some of that mucus, we use a mucolytic called uh, atrovent. Now, another thing that we need to consider is corticosteroids. Corticosteroids fix the last thing that I just that I just said, narrowing of the bronchioles due to airway edema. So a corticosteroid reduces edema. So the one that we utilize the most in pre-hospital setting is uh, solumedrol, also known as methylprednisone. And then the last thing that I, I said that I would push to the end was our mag sulfate. Mag sulfate, remember, is an electrolyte. We give mag sulfate uh, because it has uh, smooth muscle relaxation properties, right? And it really helps out uh, your beta-2 agonists relax those, that airway and open it up. Works great. Remember, that's two grams over uh, like 15 to 30 minutes. So it's, it's a long drip. Now, is that a uh, 10 or 60 drop set? It's a 10. 10 drop set. All right, COPD. COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Remember, there's two different kinds. We got chronic bronchitis and we have emphysema. Now, what occurs with COPD? Remember, this is, now we're talking about somebody who's a lot 
older, right? Typically affects people that have year, that doesn't have to be because they smoke, could be because work-related injury uh, to their lungs. They, you know, they have long lasting damage that's chronic with their lungs and the actual tissue of the lungs get affected. Now, a problem that occurs with COPD ears is again, air trapping. Whenever you hear of the, the term barrel chested, what they're talking about is somebody whose lungs are like overinflated and they're having a difficult time getting the air out. And it's like long, long term of that overinflation that occurs that gives them that barrel chested look. Some signs and symptoms. Uh, we know that the patient's going to be uh, tachypnic. The patient's going to be uh, desaturated. And that might be normal for them. We always have to remember that end stage COPD ears uh, work off of something called hypoxic drive. Now, all of us that, that don't have COPD, remember what did I say that our respiratory drive is based off of CO2. So whenever my CO2 starts to stack and gets higher, my respiratory rate increases to get rid of it. COPD ears, not the case, all right? They're based off of a SpO2. Now, when their SpO2 is normal for them, we all know 94 to 99 is considered normal for us. For them, they be, might be at 90, and that's completely okay for their breathing rate. Now, we need to be able to respect that as providers and say, hey, man, if 90 is good for you, it's good for me. But if my patient is tachypnic and they're having a difficult time breathing, I might need to give them a little bit of oxygen, okay? Sometimes that's all they need. Now, I know you guys are paramedics and you guys want to give um, a ton of treatment. You might be like, hell yeah, man, I want to give my beta-2 agonists. I want to give my mag sulfate, my solumedrol. Um, sometimes they don't need any of that, right? This patient lives with shortness of breath their entire life. This patient's always on oxygen. And sometimes all we need to do as providers is just increase it a little bit. So don't be getting crazy when you see a COPD ear that has a pulse oximetry of like 88 and they're a little bit tachypnic. Doesn't mean that we need to go balls to the walls and give them a bunch of stuff. Sometimes all we have to do is increase their oxygen from two liters a minute to four and see where that takes them. If a, if a patient with COPD calls you because they're short of breath, it's usually a bad thing, right? We call that COPD exacerbation. And COPD exacerbation can be terrible. That could be a very challenging call for you because this patient's going to, um, going to be crashing. And there's a, you, have to, you have to act fast. So when we think about all the medications that we have to give, a lot of the ones that I mentioned for um, our asthma, patients is very similar. Uh, one of the ones that we kind of don't give to COPD ears is uh, epinephrine, all right? A lot of COPD ears, they are associated, their COPD is also associated with uh, heart failure and heart disease. So believe it or not, those lungs being hyperinflated causes what's known as pulmonary hypertension. And pulmonary hypertension actually causes left ventricular failure all right, or, and right ventricular failure. So these patients also have uh, heart failure with COPD. Uh, did I hit everything? Yep, we're good with it. Pulmonary embolism. Whenever I'm taking a test and let's say it's a respiratory type question and they give me some vital signs, but inside the question, they state that it was a sudden onset of dyspnea red flag. All right. Sudden onset. Typically they're talking about a PE. Whenever I hear sudden onset, another thing, a couple of things that I'm looking for, sudden onset of dyspnea, sudden onset of chest pain, cyanosis that does not get fixed with oxygen. So my patient has shortness of breath. I'm giving them oxygen because their SpO2 is low and it's not fixing the, the, basically, it's not fixing the problem, all right? These are patients that have PEs. Now, these patients need to be taken to the emergency department, okay? Uh, a lot of the times, you're going to be doing a 12 lead. You're trying to figure out what's going on. 
Uh, note that the patient might have cyanosis, things of that sort. So you might clue you in that this patient could potentially be having a PE. Um, there's not really anything that we can do other than give them oxygen in the pre-hospital setting. They need to probably be put on anticoagulants at the hospital. And there's also special filters that they could put in their lungs to try to get uh, some of those clots out. All right, we got a question here. 27 year old male was sick for the past week. He states that he's been coughing up phlegm for the past two days. He states that he had an acute onset of chest pain and dyspnea. Again, acute onset, it just happened, right? Chest pain and shortness of breath. What's different between this patient versus a patient that could potentially have a PE? Now, could this guy have a PE? Sure. Now, if I was the one taking the test, I'd be cluing in on what are my answers on here. Do they give me the option of it being a PE and spontaneous pneumo? Now, the reason why I would jump on spontaneous, spontaneous pneumo all day is the coughing, okay? Coughing, um, and this guy's been sick for a little while, so who knows if it's how severe his coughing has been, um, but it shows that he's been coughing up Flint for the past few days. We need to think spontaneous pneumothorax. Now, will a spontaneous pneumothorax require needle decompression? Um, the answer is going to lie in is my patient under tension or not. Understand, just because somebody has a pneumothorax does not mean that this patient is having uh, tension. Now, how, do I, how can I tell as a provider that, hey, this patient has tension versus just a pneumothorax? I have to look at signs of shock, okay? Obviously, my patient is going to be having dyspnea. Obviously, my patient is going to have pleuritic chest pain, pain on inspiration. Uh, but, and my patient might also have diminished lung sounds on one side. Just because I have all that does not give you the right to put a needle into their chest right, as needle decompression. Your patient has to have signs of shock, right? Could be cool pale diaphoretic, um, maybe an increased heart rate that's showing you that this patient could be- um, uh, after 30 when I get my- That the patient could be compensating, something that we need to really think about, okay? Do spontaneous pneumos get needle decompressed? Absolutely, right? But they get monitored until they go under tension then they perform the needle decompression. A lot of these patients that have a spontaneous pneumo, they get monitored in a hospital and believe it or not, some of those just heal up on their own. Not a big deal. Is innovation necessary? Is it necessary? Um, this is an interesting topic to say, hey man, should we be innovating people um, when I could just bag them? The answer is, yeah, there's some problems with just ventilating somebody with a BVM. Um, it gets a little bit better when you use a superglottic airway and you can utilize uh, an eye gel or a king tube or an LMA, things of that sort, um, to reduce the chance of aspiration, right? Um, BVMing alone is not the answer. Obviously, you, it's a skill that EMTs have, and will it save people? Sure. Long term, BVMing is a problem. And the first Number one thing is it's difficult to maintain a seal. You might think that you're awesome at BVMing until you have a patient that has a weird shaped face. Um, you know, sometimes it's just not easy to maintain a seal on a patient. Also, every provider has a different size hand, right? Some people it's really challenging to withhold that seal. So make sure, um, that you understand that just BVMing alone can be problematic because of improper use of the BVM. Gastric distension is another one. If I am BVMing somebody and I'm forcefully uh, positive pressure ventilation, uh, ventilating them, some of that air is gonna go into their stomach, okay? Not all of it's gonna go into their chest, this is why we say, hey, all we're looking for is chest rise because anything greater than chest rise, it's going into the patient's stomach. If you have too much uh, gastric distension, you're obviously going to cause that patient to vomit and then you have a chance for aspiration. 
Is your tube good once it's in? Obviously, we need to check. Now, how do I know that my, my tube is good? I first visualized it going into those vocal cords. Next thing I'm going to do is I need to assess my lung sounds and gastric sounds. Okay. Once I assess for that, I need to go ahead and apply in tidal capnography. Understand this in tidal capnography is the best way to know that your tube is in place. I don't give a shit what number it is just because your patient's in cardiac arrest and you're expecting to see an in tidal capnography that's really low because they're obviously not moving any blood at all. If we have good chest compressions and we apply that tube or that uh, in tidal capnography to our tube, when we ventilate, we should still get a waveform. We should still have a number on our end tidal capnography. If that waveform does not come up and it just stays at zero, you have a bad tube. I don't care if there's misting in the tube, if whoever listened to lung sounds like, no, I heard it. No, you, you really didn't. All right. End tidal capnography. Make sure you have it on. What if they buck the tube? All right. Bucking the tube. Something that needs to be discussed because this is going to happen to you, all right? You have a patient who's intubated. We're in route, and all of a sudden, you hear that the patient is either coughing or making a noise, or the patient's on a ventilator, and the ventilator is blowing off, making the sound. Whenever that patient is bucking or breathing back. So that, that, let's say that ventilator is breathing air into the patient. While the patient breathes out, creating that pressure is going to make that ventilator noise go off. How do we fix it? Okay. We utilize benzodiazepines. We sedate. Okay. Make sure you have sedation handy, something nearby that we can give that patient. So if that patient, if the first thing usually that we'll notice is the patient's blinking, that patient's going to start to wake up here and buff the tube. I want to stop that from happening. So I should have some sort of benzodiazepine on standby, ready to roll. Criking. There's two different ways that we can perform a cricothyrotomy, right? We have an open crike, which is there on the top, and we have a needle crike, which you see on the bottom. Now, why crike, right? To perform a cricothyrotomy, this is probably the most invasive skill that you would ever use as a paramedic. And the reason why we'll do it is because we can't get any other means of getting air in, right? I can't bag the patient. I can't tube the patient. I can't drop a supraglottic airway. Anything that I do just doesn't work, right? Either I can't squeeze the bag and I have poor bag compliance. If that ever happens to you and you have just really bad bag compliance and you know you're in the trachea, you could have bilateral uh, pneumothorax. So always consider that as an option. But if let's say I have really bad uh, facial damage or really bad damage to the patient's neck and I can't visualize the vocal cords, there's no way of me ventilating, you have to think of a cricothyrotomy. Now, everybody here is pretty comfortable with the one on the top, open crike, right? Remember, it's going into the cricothyroid membrane, which is right below the thyroid cartilage. So we have, remember, TC. Thyroid cartilage, then cricoid cartilage. Right in between the two, we have the cricothyroid membrane. And that's what we're cutting to access that patient's uh, trachea. Now, let's talk about the needle crike. This is not talked about a lot, especially in pre-hospital settings, at least not anymore. And I'll tell you why. Um, for one, needle crikes aren't as good as open crikes. Imagine you trying to breathe through a little tiny straw. It's, it's challenging also because most agencies don't carry what they consider a high pressure jet ventilator. A high pressure jet ventilator needs to be attached to a needle crike to provide adequate tidal volume. Okay. So how it works is that you as the paramedic or you as the first responder locates that cricothyroid membrane now you take the needle, which the diameter is the same diameter of a 14 or 16 gauge, and that goes into the cricothyroid membrane towards the feet. Obviously, you're not going to put it towards the patient's head, 
towards the feet. You go through that trachea, and then you can go ahead and attach your uh, high pressure jet ventilator to it. Now, it's a lot less messy, obviously, than an open crike, but understand it buys the responder time to perform an open crike. So ultimately, these patients need some sort of tracheostomy or an open crike to be performed. Um, and the needle crike is just buying them time. <clears throat> but let's say you have a test question and the test question uh, gives you every inclination that, hey man, this patient needs to be criked, but open crike is not one of the answers. But let's say needle crike is, you have to consider that. Especially if you know this patient needs to be criked, needle crike would be an appropriate answer. All right. That was a lot of respiratory. Um, <clears throat> we're going to jump into cardiology now. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to tell you right now, this is not going to be like an EKG lecture. Um, I have like one slide that's a little bit about EKGs and that's pretty much it. So if you're hoping to get a lot of EKG discussions, uh, today is not bad day. Why is your patient having chest pain? Chest pain comes fourth on your patient because their heart is lacking oxygen, okay? Your body has these receptors on, uh, for your cardiac muscle that when it, it becomes ischemic, it signals to your patient that there's pain in that location. <clears throat> we as providers have to know that to say, hey man, this person has chest pain, which means they're not getting enough blood to their heart, which means we have to do some sort of certain treatments to fix that right? Um, what do we, and, and that's what we're suspecting is the cause, lack of blood flow. Now, what do we call lack of blood flow to the heart? Um, we call it an MI, right? Myocardial infarction. When somebody has a lack of blood flow, that heart tissue starts to die off. It starts to become injured. This is why we perform 12 lead EKGs. This is what we're looking for um, to see if we can get it fixed, uh, taking that patient to some sort of cath lab. Angina versus myocardial infarction. Remember, angina uh, typically gets fixed with once they stop doing whatever physical force that their exertion that they're doing. Let's say that they're mowing the lawn or they're on a run, and all of a sudden they start to get this chest pain. When they slow down and stop, does the chest pain go away? And does the chest pain? Let's say it doesn't go away, and they call nine one one, and you give them, let's say. Uh, aspirin and a spray of nitro and it goes away. Now you might be saying, oh, this might just be angina versus myocardial infarction where that patient stops or the patient gets this chest pain from doing nothing at all. Let's say that they're in the bathroom uh, showering or they're just doing something, they're eating food, they're eating dinner, and all of a sudden this chest pain comes uh, out of nowhere, just acute onset of chest pain and it doesn't go away on its own. This is now a lot more considered myocardial infarction, but definitely something you need to consider when you're reading a test. What was my patient doing before the chest pain started? 12 liter IV, that's a, <laughs> so these type of questions, I see them in tests a lot. Um, your patient is a 82 year old male uh, who's complaining of substernal chest pain out of 10 out of 10, right? You as a paramedic, especially paramedic students, they want to, they want to treat. Let's give them aspirin, nitro, let's get a line, let's give morphine, let's do this and that, get a 12 lead. All right, we're trying to diagnose, right? I'm cool with you giving meds, right? There's certain medications, like I just said, that we don't even need a line. We can give them four baby aspirin, all right? 324 milligrams. We can start with a spray of nitro. Remember, we have to wait three to five minutes before I can even give another one. An IV is the last thing I need right now. The last thing I need right now, get a 12 lead. Now I just said the treatments. Um, remember total of 1.2 or three sprays sublingual nitro is what we're gonna be giving. Just remember that our patient isn't taking any sexually enhancing drugs in the past 24 to 48 hours. And my patient's systolic blood pressure is greater than 90. As long as I have that, I can give my nitroglycerin. 
you should get it you should get it twelve before you give any meds because if you have uh, right side involvement, you're going to be giving nitro. Exactly right. Right. So a lot of EMTs that are giving nitroglycerin to patients have no idea if our patient has right side involvement. So 12 EDKGs need to happen as soon as possible to rule it out. Right. And remember, if my patient has inferior wall, two, three, and ABF on my 12 EDKG, I need to check for a right sided involvement. Either I'm going to take all, uh, all the leads and move them over to my right side or I am going to uh, just take lead V4 and move it over. But good point, Jesse. All right, blood flow through the coronary arteries. Now, people are always afraid of coronary artery type questions, right? They're like, damn, uh, is it a circumflex? Is it a left anterior descending? Remember this, you have two main coronary arteries, right and left, pretty easy, right? The left coronary artery is this big guy right here, okay? The left coronary artery is the largest diameter coronary artery that is there, right? It's the lar largest in diameter. Now, that left artery actually breaks or splits off into your left, um, left anterior descending artery and your what's called the circumflex. I'm not going to go over what they supply blood to. Just understand that that one uh, coronary artery splits into both of those. And then we have the right coronary artery over on the other side that just stays the right coronary artery. Okay. Now, what I do want you guys to remember is blood flow to these coronary arteries occurs during diastole, right? When that heart is relaxed, when those ventricles are relaxed, those blood, the blood basically rushes into these coronary arteries and allows it to basically feed the heart with oxygenated blood. All right, this is my one slide to talk about EKGs really quick. Just a refresher on how can I read an EKG. First thing that I want to check, what is my rate? All right. On this particular EKG that I'm looking at right now, I have three second markers, which are here at the top. I got a three second marker here. So this is a total of three seconds. And this is another total of three seconds on this side. So we have a six second strip. And I know that if I count my R waves, which are the top of these QRS complexes, I can tell you about what rate I have, right? So that is one method to tell my rate, to say, hey, is this fast or is it slow? Regularity, is it regular or irregular? For this to be regular, all of these R waves have to be in line, okay? We know by looking at this EKG, this is an irregular EKG. Look at the gap between here and then the gap between here. Way different, right? We know this is an irregular when we talk about regularity. Next thing we look at, QRS width. A normal QRS width is less than 0.11, right? 0.11 and less is considered normal. Anything greater than that is considered wide and complex. So we look at this. Now, just real quick, if you remember each little box, when we look at it from left to right, we're talking about duration. And that's 0 0.04 seconds in duration with every little box. But when we look at one large box, remember we have five little boxes in one large box. So it's 0 0.20 seconds across. So whenever I think about, hey man, it's gotta be 0.11 and less for it to be considered normal. It's gotta be less than three tiny boxes uh, within that QRS complex. And we look over at this one, for example, there's the beginning, there's the end of my QRS complex. So it's less than three little blocks and that is considered normal. 
Number four, does it have P waves? P waves signify to me that this is coming from the atrium. Not only do I look at, hey, is it narrow and complex, which means it's an atrial rhythm, but I'm also looking to see, is it firing from our SA node? And our SA node creates P waves. So whenever I see P waves and uh, narrow QRS complexes, I know this is coming from the SA node. So that's another way to diagnose EKGs. And the last thing that I look at is my PRI. For example, this EKG that we're looking at right now signifies that we have a problem with our PR intervals, right? Because we have what appears, well, what appears to be a P wave here, but we're missing a QRS complex, right? So just because I'm missing this QRS complex, I know that, hey man, I'm looking at some sort of AV block. So the fact that I'm missing QRS complexes, I know that this is gonna be a second degree block. So the first thing that me as a provider has to do is look at this EKG and say, hey man, what are my PRIs? A PRI should be between 0.12 seconds to 0.20 seconds. Right here, I got, I'm looking at my PRIs and they all appear to be identical. What I'm looking for to see is, hey man, are they changing in duration or do they look the same? They all look about the same. So that makes this a second degree type two. If it was second degree type one, remember going, going, gone, I would see different uh, sizes and those PRIs, but because these PRIs are staying consistent, this is considered a second degree type two. Please know this though, the five essentials to reading an EKG. Heart failure. All right. We got LVF and we have RVF. That you have to understand as a healthcare provider on how the blood flow through the heart works, right? And by knowing how the blood flow works throughout the heart, I know that if my patient has blood being backed up into my lungs, I have left ventricular failure, okay? So you approach your patient, your patient has crackles or rails, um, and my patient has history of heart failure, or they might not, but I do note that my patient might have pedal edema, um, again, dyspnea. My patient has left ventricular failure. Remember, left ventricular failure will cause right ventricular failure as well. Right-sided heart failure is typically noted because the patient has per, uh, peripheral edema, right? We see edema in the patient's legs, maybe sacral edema. We see different edema throughout the patient. Um, that's a sign of right-sided heart failure. Now, real quick, when we start talking about signs and symptoms of the two, left-sided heart failure typically is going to have a very high blood pressure. It's a good thing, right? If I have a patient that has left ventricular failure with high blood pressure, I know I'm dealing with CHF. If I have that same patient that has the crackles, uh, what appears to be heart failure, but I have a low blood pressure, I'm dealing with cardiogenic shock, okay? So something that you need to be mindful about that you're looking at to say, hey man, how am I gonna treat this patient? Um, and is it gonna change dependent on my blood pressure? And the answer is absolutely. Because remember left ventricular failure, I'm treating with CPAP, I'm gonna be treating with nitroglycerin, right? Potentially Lasix, if your protocols allow. Um, now, if my patient has a low blood pressure, low blood pressure, hypotension, I can't give any of that, right? It's all contraindicated. So we can't use it. So at that point, my patient's in cardiogenic shock, which we're going to get to. Right side of heart failure, my patient's going to have a preload problem, right? The right side of their heart is not functioning properly. And that's where our deoxygenated blood comes into the heart. If that's not working, that's when that patient starts to back up blood into systemic circulation. And because they have a preload problem, we need to increase preload, right? These patients are going to need fluid support. The question, should they be receiving fluids? If so, when should you stop? Now, whenever we talk about fluid management and we talk about, hey man, I'm trying to increase my patient's blood pressure. What systolic blood pressure are we trying to achieve? 
at least 90. I need to get at least 90. Now, that doesn't mean that, hey, man, you know, 90 is pretty much there on the borderline. You know, I got 90 right now. We might as well just shut off our fluids. Be careful, right? If I don't shut it off, and I'm like, oh, dude, I'd rather have a blood pressure of 130. That's a lot more stable than 90. You can overload these patients, right? If I start giving a lot of fluids, and let's say that I'm getting above 90, now I'm above 110, now I'm above 120, and I start to hear my lung sound start to turn into crackles, I created that, right? Me as a provider have to know when to stop giving fluids. If your patient is hypotensive with left ventricular failure, max, max, max amount of fluid that you're allowed to give that patient per the textbook and per national standards is 200 mLs. We don't give any more than that. Kind of already talked a lot about CHF, left ventricular failure, uh, signs and symptoms again, crackles, rails, uh, tachypnea. Our patient might have, uh, remember left ventricular failure is gonna cause right ventricular failure. So I'm gonna have pedal edema. Steps for treatment. What do we do first for these patients? Provide oxygen. How do I provide oxygen to a patient with CHF? As long as my blood pressure allows, what you see on the screen is what we're doing. We're providing positive pressure ventilations, right? Continuous positive pressure. I'm not gonna just lay this person down to bag them because remember, this patient is going to have orthopnea. If I lay them down, I'm going to increase their trouble breathing. So I wanna set them up high. You should be allowing their legs to even dangle if possible, all right? And provide CPAP. Now, CPAP is going to be worked uh, uh, through PEEP, right? Positive and expiratory pressure. Now, this positive and expiratory pressure should be measured in uh, centimeters of water. We started at five to 10. We have therapeutic ranges, five, 7.5, and 10. So typically what we'll do is we'll start at five and we'll work our way up to improve oxygenation, improve that patient's shortness of breath. Next thing that we can give this patient again, I mentioned it, nitroglycerin. Why is nitro given to a patient that has heart failure? Because we want to decrease preload. Now you might be like, oh my gosh, this isn't making sense because Mike already said right ventricular failure already has a preload problem. Why do I want to decrease preload even more? Because the patient has left-sided heart failure, the heart's working really hard to get that blood moving, but the heart's starting to fail. Now, what happens when your heart starts to fail, your patient starts to, their heart rate's going to start to increase. It's going to start to work even harder. But guess what? That heart's dying. I want to just help that heart relax. I'm going to give that patient nitroglycerin glycerin to decrease preload to help that heart relax. All right. One thing that I mentioned is furosemide or Lasix. Your textbook states it is no longer uh, intended for pre-hospital use. Are hospitals and uh, some providers still giving Lasix? Absolutely. But just remember, Lasix is used for, it's a loop diuretic. It's used to get that fluid out. But there's some problems with just trying to get rid of that fluid. If this patient has pneumonia, and I don't know because I never drew labs, I can cause some serious problems. Okay. If I don't know that this patient doesn't have pneumonia, and I just hear rails, and I'm like, oh, I think it could be CHF, but I'm not 100% sure, you probably shouldn't be giving Lasix. If your patient's dehydrated, and your patient has an infection, you're going to cause a lot more harm than good by giving a drug like Lasix. Okay, so there's a lot of contraindications. Obviously, hypotension is a big one as well. What if my patient has chest pain? Can I treat chest pain with a patient that has shortness of breath because of CHF? And the answer is absolutely. We are still going to be treating chest pain. Understand something too. Um, a lot of these patients that have CHF, remember their heart is failing. Is it possible that those patients having an MI? Yes. There's a big possibility that your patient's having an MI. So do your 12 leads. 
This is another thing that, remember, I brought up with COPD. COPD plays a big factor in patients with cardiac history, right? Causes some pulmonary hypertension, can cause this patient to be having an MI. We need to be doing 12 leads, okay? Some CPAP contraindications. If, if, if my patient can't follow commands, can, I, can they be put on the CPAP? Absolutely not, right? So you need to be able to coach that patient on breathing, um, remember you have to have a systolic blood pressure greater than 90. Why? Because CPAP is going to cause an increase in intrathoracic pressure. And that intrathoracic pressure can put pressure on the vena cava, which will decrease preload and cause that patient to, uh, that blood pressure to lower. Now you might say, well, Mike, you just said decreasing preload is a good thing for CHF. Yes. If the patient's blood pressure is super high, it's a good thing. If blood pressure is really low, it's a really, really bad thing. And you're going to cause that patient to bottom out. Okay. So remember that if my blood pressure is high, CPAP and nitro, let's lower down that preload. That's a good thing. We can start to normalize that blood pressure. If the blood pressure is really low, do not use it. Remember, it's got to be greater than 90 systolic. Cardiogenic shock. What is cardiogenic shock? We just mentioned it. A little bit ago, it's CHF basically. So it's your patient with left ventricular failure and the heart is so weak that it can't do its job. The heart is literally failing. The heart is going into its own version of shock. Signs and symptoms, weakness, potentially unresponsive, right? These patients with cardiogenic shock, uh, sometimes I find patients that are CHF, I see the pedal edema, they look super weak and they're laying supine probably the worst place for that patient or position for that patient to lay. Remember I said they're going to be or have orthopnea, dyspnea with positioning. So the patient's literally drowning, sleeping or laying down flat and they don't have the strength to even pick themselves up and they're just sitting there drowning internally. Something I see often with cardiogenic shock. What's our treatment? Tility. Now there's a byproduct of increasing contractility that we need to talk about with our treatments. I'll give you an example. If I give dopamine greater than five mics per kilogram per minute, I know that I'm gonna increase inotropic, right? Which is contractility. That's a good thing. That's what I just said we wanna do for cardiogenic shock. But what's another thing that's gonna increase? Rate, right? Because chronotropic and dromotropic is gonna increase rate, correct. It's gonna increase oxygen demand to the heart, which is gonna potentially, you could say it's going to cause more damage than good. But understand, if you do not increase contractility or forcefulness of that heart, the patient is going to die. Okay. So utilizing pressors, um, vasoactive medications, such as dopamine, epi infusions, or norepinephrine to at least increase the systolic blood pressure of at least 90. If you can't do that, the patient's going to code. Okay, so we kind of left to like outweigh uh, what's best for this patient at that point. Remember, we need a, a blood pressure of at least 90 response. Why, why would we ever want to perform a vagal maneuver to lower a heart rate? Typically in EMS, that's the only reason why we would ever perform a, a vagal maneuver is to decrease a heart rate. So it's probably the most least invasive thing that we can do as an EMS provider. Ask a patient to blow through a, a, a syringe, a straw. We can ask them to bear down. Um, there's something called carotid massage that we do not practice in EMS because a lot of people will do it wrong. Um, but there's a lot of different methods of performing vagal maneuvers and they do work. I think I've broken SVT twice with vagal maneuvers. Amiodarone. When should it be used? All right. Amiodarone is used as a class three antidiarrhythmic, and it is used in a patient who has a shockable rhythm in cardiac arrest, right? Our shockable, we have two shockable rhythms in cardiac arrest. We have what's here on the screen right now, which is VTAC, and we also have VFib. Remember, amiodarone can be utilized as a uh, cardiac dysrhythmia 
And that first dose is 300 milligrams. Second dose would be 150. So that's the first reason why or time when we can use amiodarone. The next time we can utilize amiodarone is to slow down a fast heart rate. Okay. The, the rhythm that you see on the screen is VTAC. And VTAC with a pulse, the treatment ultimately can be amiodarone. But that amiodarone would be given as an infusion. 150 milligrams in a 50 ml bag given over 10 minutes using a 10 drop set equals out to about 50 drops per minute. And we let it run, right? Just to lower down that heart rate. I can also utilize that amiodarone, that same amiodarone infusion for SVT. All right, so understand what it does is it blocks ions, cardiac ion channels, right? And it slows down the heart's rate. So that's why it, and why and when it should be used. All right, synchronized cardioversion. Talking about fast rates. Synchronized cardioversion is utilized when a patient's heart rate is too fast and it's not slowing down, even though we've given medications or your patient is what's considered unstable. Unstable is always going to be linked with signs of shock, right? So we have a patient that let's say has a heart rate of 193. That's what you see up there on the screen. And <clears throat> let's say they're have altered mental status. The patient has, um, they look pale, they're unresponsive, blood pressure is low. So you opt to say, hey man, I'm not gonna give any medications to this patient. I'm gonna jump right into cardioversion because they're considered unstable. Now, what do we set the joules? Joules are gonna be set at, one, uh, if it's narrow and complex, remember narrow, when I say narrow and complex, I'm talking about that QRS complex. If that QRS complex is 0.11 and less, it's considered narrow. So we're gonna be setting our joules to 50 to 100. If it is greater than that 0.11, it's considered wide and complex, we're gonna be giving, uh, we're starting at 100. Remember, after we shocked at that first uh, jewel setting, which could be 100 for both, the next jewel setting that we're gonna set it to is 200, and we're gonna stay at 200, okay? You're not gonna go to 300, 360, unless that's what your protocols are. Uh, for national standards, we're, we're staying at 200, and we are riding 200. Pacing, pacing's a little bit different. That's what we see here on the bottom. Um, you do note this pacer spike. All right, you see these pacer spikes where that P wave should be, right? And that pacer spike is just showing that, hey, we have what's considered electrical capture. So typically whenever we're gonna pace somebody, the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna set a rate. The rate should be anywhere from 60 to 80 typically. Um, sometimes they say 60 to 90, but I like to say 80 Brady, just cause it sounds cool. Um, once I set my rate, now I have to increase my milliamperage. As I increase that milliamperage, what it does is it starts to show me these pacer spikes throughout that my EKG. Once I see a pacer spike followed by a wide and bizarre QRS complex, I know that I have what's called electrical capture. Once I have electrical capture, I'm going to go up one more time to lock it in place. And then I need to assess my patient's blood pressure and check for a mechanical capture, which is checking for a pulse. Should we be giving atropine first? Great question for, for, for greater cardio purposes. Because we just talked about fast rhythms. It's like, hey, man, should I be giving adenosine before I synchronize cardio? Well, if my patient's unstable, the answer is no, right? Just jump straight into synchronized cardio version. Um, now, if you look at the algorithm for atropine, it states that your patient has to be hemodynamically unstable for you to even give atropine. So shouldn't we be giving atropine whenever we pace? Now, it is going to be kind of your discretion. You're gonna be with a patient, Obviously, if you're giving any sort of treatment for bradycardia, your patient better be symptomatic with a low blood pressure. 
Um, Because remember, there's a lot of people that walk around with bradycardia. Some of you that are listening to this right now probably have bradycardia, right? That's just normal for you. You're not going to pace or give yourself atropine. Why would you do it to this patient? So they have to be symptomatic. They have to be uh, hemodynamically unstable. If your patient is crashing on you, so alter mental status is a huge one for me. If I see my patient is altered and really going into shock, I can opt to start pacing immediately. For the most part, I usually will be giving my atropine first before I start pacing patients. All right. Um, what atropine does, real quick, just talk about it. It uh, blocks off that acetylcholine to the heart, and that basically blocks off the parasympathetic response. So it makes that heart rate increase. Mike, I have a question. Yo. Uh, you wouldn't give atropine for a second degree type two or third degree, correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. And the whole reason behind that is when you give atropine, atropine, remember it affects the acetylcholine, right? That goes into the heart. Now that with the acetylcholine, that's what that's doing is it's stimulating the SA node to fire, to create P waves. When you have a second degree type two, or a third degree block, we don't have problems with P waves. We have a lot of P waves. Every QRS complex is gonna have a P wave. We're still giving it. But remember that it will increase contractility. You arrive to find a bystander performing CPR on an unresponsive patient. What do you do first? All right. So we just walked in on this patient who is appears that they're in cardiac arrest, right? Who's this bystander, by the way? I don't know her. Is she is she a nurse? Is she a doctor? She's performing CPR, which is awesome. I always like to see bystanders doing CPR. But are they doing that because they know that they should be doing that? Or are they doing that just because that's what they, they think they should be doing? I'm a healthcare provider. What do I do in this scenario is I check a pulse. I stop the bystander from doing chest compressions. Hold on. I tell him to back up and I, and I assess for a pulse. If the patient is pulseless, either I ask them to continue doing chest compressions or I have to start doing chest compressions. Okay. Now, next question here. What if the patient's family arrives to this location and they state, hey man, stop. I don't want you to do chest compressions on my dad. He has a DNR. Should I stop? Just because somebody says that they have a DNR does not mean that the patient has a DNR. I hate to tell you that, that people have malintention, but there is a chance that they're going to say, yeah, my dad has a DNR um, and does not. Okay. So we need to ask for the paperwork. If they can't provide the DNR, we don't stop. We keep doing chest compressions, right? We're not going to terminate resuscitative efforts. Can you consider terminating resuscitative efforts? Can we stop doing chest compressions? Let's say that we start running this code, right? You start running the code. Is there at any point a time where you can say, hey man, like, what are we doing? Why, why are we doing this right now? We need to stop. Or, or you come, if I show up on this scene, for example, and this girl has been doing chest compressions now for 15 minutes, I find out. I put them on the monitor, the patient's asystole. The patient's cold to the touch, right? Things of that sort. Me as a provider, I can stop resuscitative efforts. But you just have to know that it's something that you're going to come across, especially on like a test. Uh, pneumonia is one that's like really popular. And the reason why I say it's popular is that there's certain like uh, signs and symptoms that you need to understand that pneumonia is going to have versus we'll say CHF, right? But as we said that the patient, just because they have what appears to be crackles in their lungs or can be ronchi with pneumonia, doesn't mean that they have CHF and doesn't not mean that they have pneumonia. But typically in a test, when they give you vital signs, if you see a fever and the patient has crackles, or they, they're telling you that the patient was sick, or they, they're trying to point you in a direction that they're not talking about it being cardiac and related. Okay. 
But we know that all pneumonia means is that our patient has a lung infection. That's what pneumonia is. So the patient's going to have fluid filled up in the alveoli, um, and that's going to cause dyspnea because the patient's unable to diffuse oxygen and carbon dioxide. Okay, this patient needs antibiotic treatment, ultimately, right? Sepsis, um, similar topic, similar concept of having an infection. Uh, the difference between sepsis and pneumonia, remember pneumonia is an infection of the lungs. Sepsis is systemic infection. So infection throughout the entire body, right? Some signs and symptoms, patient could be altered. Patient's gonna have a fever, not always, right? So if the patient did have a fever and then now all of a sudden you're there and the patient either doesn't have a fever or the patient's hypothermic, does not mean that the patient's not in sepsis. Patients could be septic without a fever. It just means that their body is uh, decompensating, right? That process of fighting off the infection, the body's losing, okay? Um, decreased carbon dioxide. Remember this patient has widespread vasodilation and because of that, the patient has a difficult time getting that oxygenated blood out, all right, that carbon dioxide out. Um, and because of that, your patient's going to have acidosis. We call that metabolic acidosis. Maybe dyspnea. They could be um, hot to the touch on certain parts of their body where there's an infection that you might see, maybe flushing. This comes into the topic of an increase in capillary permeability. Remember, when we talk about capillary permeability, we're talking about moving fluids in and out of the cells, right? Now, your body's trying to fight off this infection. It increases its inflammatory response. So let's say that the guy had a uh, <clears throat> MRSA or some sort of infection in his skin, and the body's trying to fight off that infection. What are you going to note in that location other than warm touch to the skin? You'll note inflammation. Now, how does that inflammation happen? Increased capillary permeability, right? That fluid is now going to get dispersed to that location and cause it to swell. Something you got to note with patients with sepsis. How are we going to treat septic patients? Fluids, exactly what you see here. Um, again, these patients need antibiotics. If you're not giving antibiotics in your protocol, we're treating with fluids. How much fluids? Enough fluids to maintain at least a systolic blood pressure of 90. Can we overload these patients? Absolutely you can. And you can actually cause a lot of harm if you give too much fluids. Be mindful. Typically, when, whenever you're reading a text uh, or you're reading a test and they're talking about how much fluids we're going to be giving, if the answer has at least a blood pressure of 90 systolic, I'm going for that. Um, if that doesn't, but they have something like 20 mLs per kilogram, that's what I'm going for, right? I can give up to 20 mLs per kilogram for an adult patient or pediatric patient, or even an infant patient, I could give up to 20 mLs per kilogram. Be mindful, does not mean I have to give 20 mLs per kilogram. That might be too much fluids. So I wanna maintain a blood pressure of at least 90 systolic. Meningitis, real quick, whenever they tell you that your patient has a stiff neck and a fever, it should be game time. That's the easiest, easiest test question to come across. And once they start giving you some of these signs and symptoms, fever, headache, joint pain, rash, seizures is kind of uncommon, but it's possible, right? Because it's meningitis. It's the meninges of the brain that's causing inflammation. Um, you got to pay attention to the symptoms. But the, the stiff neck thing, I see that in so many test questions. It's funny. It's like, all right, that's an easy answer. Ultimately, these patients, remember, also another thing with meningitis, it's contagious. So be careful. UTIs, believe it or not, UTI is the number one reason why elderly patients are altered mental status or suffer from altered mental status. Foul smelling odor of their urine, right? Cloudy color of urine, constant urge to urinate. These are all very popular or common signs and symptoms. Um, we can treat these patients again, just like sepsis. We can provide fluids. They're trying to, the reason why this patient urinates a lot is their body's trying to flush it out. We can assist with that. Hyperkalemia, high potassium in the blood. Now there's a couple of reasons why you might have high potassium in the blood. One really popular one is your patient stops 
dialysis, all right? Your patient normally gets dialyzed, let's say every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and your patient just didn't want to go on Friday. And like, yeah, no, I'm good. Or the patient has dementia and they just forgot, right? And they start skipping dialysis. What's going to happen is their body has a very difficult time filtrating the blood and getting rid of that potassium. And that potassium starts to increase in their body. Because of that, that potassium could potentially cause cardiac dysrhythmias. Two of the most common cardiac dysrhythmias that you'll see with hyperkalemia, bradycardia and VTAC, right? If you see these and you have a patient that's on dialysis, you need to consider hyperkalemia. Another thing that you might note is tented or peaked T waves, right? Once we start to see peak T waves, we can go ahead and diagnose this patient might be hyperkalemic. You will see that also in like lead to if your patient's uh, bradycardic and you see those peak T waves, we need to consider calcium and sodium bicarb for these patients. Another one that I didn't discuss was uh, crush, crush syndrome. Remember when a patient's crushed for a long period of time, we'll get into it with trauma, but you'll, they'll also have a dump of uh, potassium in their blood cause hyperkalemia. We, we mentioned the treatment, uh, calcium chloride and sodium bicarbonate. Last thing I'm gonna to discuss tonight is abdominal pain. All right, abdominal pain is, can be a lot of different things, right? So it can be really challenging for us as providers. One thing that I always tell people is know what organ lies in which quadrant of the abdomen, right? And that'll help. Number one thing to not only know where, where things are located in the abdomen, but getting a detailed history. Get a detailed history from your patient with abdominal pain. And that'll typically try to guide you in what's going on with this patient. Do they already have GI problems, right? Do they suffer from kidney failure? Do they have problem with the pancreas, pancreatitis, things of that sort? Triple A, abdominal aortic aneurysm is a weakening of the walls of the aortic, of the descending aorta over the abdomen. <clears throat> You'll see like a bulge coming out of their abdomen and it's a pulsating uh, bulge basically. And it can burst. If that AAA bursts, the patient will die because they'll bleed out internally. Upper GI bleeds versus lower GI bleeds. Typically with upper GI bleeds, the patient, uh, their body breaks down that bleeding that occurs in the upper GI tract. And it has to now go throughout all of the, the, uh, the small intestines. And by the time it reaches the colon and the patient defecates or gets rid of it, that blood has already been turned into time, right? And it turns black. So they call it black tarry stool. Some of these patients that have GI bleeds, it gets like really bad and they just have like this black tarry stool everywhere, all over their legs, all over the ground. And it smells awesome. Lower GI bleeds, depending on where it's located, um, could be dark in color, but typically is bright red. Depending on where it's found in that lower GI tract, um, it could be really close to the colon. And because of that, if the bleed is close to the colon and it'll be bright red when it comes out. So typically that's something we need to ask the patient. Okay, they have blood in their stool. Well, where is it? What color is it? What does it look like? Um, and then we can kind of like make a deterring, uh, determining factor of what part of the uh, GI tract is bleeding. All right, appendicitis. Appendicitis is lower right. All right, lower right quadrant is what you need to remember, right? Patient has... Um, and typically it's a like sudden sharp pain, right? In their lower right quadrant um, and they'll have to get it removed. Pancreatitis, whenever you hear these like itises, a lot of the times when, when they're talking about what kind of pain these patients are experiencing, um, rebound tenderness is a popular answer, right? Uh, appendicitis, peritonitis, <clears throat> these patients are gonna have rebound tenderness. The difference with the pancreas is where it's located. Remember that's in the retroperitoneal. Um, so the back part or behind the uh, peritoneal cavity. 
but they can also have hormonal issues as well because obviously the pancreas deals with uh that's part of your endocrine system esophageal varices uh literally a breakdown of the blood vessels within your esophagus once they erode and then burst the patient's going to have a extreme amount of blood inside their esophagus. So typically what happens is they start to vomit, uh, projectile vomit of blood. And it's a lot of blood. And literally these patients will bleed out uh, internally from their esophagus. So they need surgery ASAP.